Lacus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Lacus or Courage by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Persons of the Dialogue. Lysimachus, son of Aristides. Milesius, son of Thucydides. Their sons. Nicias, Lacus, Socrates. Lysimachus. You have seen the exhibition of the man fighting in armor, Nicias and Lacus, but we did not tell you at the time the reason why my friend Milesius and I asked you to go with us and see him. I think that we may as well confess this, for we certainly ought not to have any reserve with you. The reason was that we were intending to ask your advice. Some laugh at the very notion of advising others, and, when they are asked, will not say what they think. They guess at the wishes of the person who asks them, and answer according to his, and not according to their own opinion. But, as we know that you are good judges, and will say exactly what you think, we have taken you into our counsels. And the matter about which I am making all this preface is just this. Milesius and I have two sons. That is his son, and he is named Thucydides after his grandfather, and this is mine, who is also called after his grandfather Aristides. Now we are resolved to take the greatest care of the youths, and not to let them run about as they like, which is too often the way with the young, when they are no longer children, but to begin at once and do the utmost that we can for them. And, knowing that you have sons of your own, we thought that you were most likely to have attended to their training and improvement. And, if you have not, we may remind you that you ought to have attended to them, and would invite you to assist us in the fulfillment of a common duty. I will tell you, Nicias and Lacus, even at the risk of being tedious, how we came to think of this. Melissius and I live together, and our two sons live with us, and now, as I was saying at first, we are going to confess to you. Both of us often talk to the lads about the many noble deeds which our fathers did in war and peace, in the management of the allies, and also of the affairs of the city, but neither of us has any deeds of his own which he can show. Now we are somewhat ashamed of this contrast being seen by them, and we blame our fathers for letting us be spoiled in the days of our youth, while they were occupied with the concerns of others. And this we point out to the lads, and tell them that they will not grow up to honour if they are rebellious and take no pains about themselves, but that if they take pains they may, perhaps, become worthy of the names which they bear. They, on their part, promise to comply with our wishes, and our care is to discover what studies or pursuits are likely to be most improving to them. Someone told us of this art of using weapons, which, he said, was an excellent accomplishment for a young man to learn, and he praised the man whose exhibition you have seen, and told us to go and see him. And we determined to go, and to get you to accompany us, and if you did not object, we thought that we would take counsel with you about the education of our sons. That is the matter about which we wanted to talk with you, and we hope that you will give us your opinion about this, and about any other studies or pursuits which may or may not be desirable for a young man to learn. Please to see whether you object to our proposal. Nicias, as far as I am concerned, Lysimachus and Melissius, I applaud your purpose, and will gladly assist you, and I believe that you, Lacus, will be equally glad. Lacus. Certainly, Nicias, and I quite approve of the remark which Lysimachus made about his own father, and the father of Melissius, and which is applicable not only to them, but to us, and to everyone who is occupied with public affairs. As he says, they are too apt to be negligent and careless of their own children and their private concerns. There is much truth in that remark of yours, Lysimachus, but why do you not consult our friend Socrates instead of consulting us about the education of the youths? He is of the same deem with you, 
and is always passing his time in places in which the youth have any noble study or pursuit, such as you are inquiring after. Lysimachus, why, Lacus, has Socrates ever attended to matters of this sort? Lacus, certainly, Lysimachus. Nicias, that I have the means of knowing as well as Lacus, for quite lately he supplied me with a teacher of music for my sons, Damon, the disciple of Agathocles, who is a most accomplished man in every way, as well as a musician, and a companion of inestimable value for young men at their age. Lysimachus. Those who have reached my age, Socrates, and Nicias and Lacus, fall out of acquaintance with the young, because they are generally detained at home by old age. But I hope that you, O oh, son of Sophroniscus, will let your fellow deemsmen have the benefit of any advice which you are able to give them. And I have a claim upon you as an old friend of your father, for I and he were always companions and friends, and to the hour of his death there never was a difference between us. And now it comes back to me, at the mention of your name, that I have heard these lads talking to one another at home, and often speaking of Socrates in terms of the highest praise. But I have never thought to ask them whether the son of Sophroniscus was the person whom they meant. Tell me, my boy, whether this is the Socrates of whom you have often spoken. Son. Certainly, father, this is he. Lysimachus. I am delighted to hear, Socrates, that you maintain the name of your father, who was a most excellent man and I further rejoice at the prospect of our family ties being renewed. Lacus, Indeed, Lysimachus, you ought not to give him up, for I can assure you that I have seen him maintaining not only his father's, but also his country's name. He was my companion in the retreat from Delium, and I can tell you that if others had only been like him, the honour of our country would have been maintained, and the great defeat would never have occurred. Lysimachus, that is very high praise which is given you, Socrates, by faithful witnesses, and for deserts like these. And let me tell you the pleasure which I feel in hearing of your fame, and I hope that you will regard me as one of your best friends. Indeed, you ought to have visited us long ago, and reckoned us among your friends. But now, from this day forward, as we have at last found one another out, do as I say, come and make acquaintance with me, and with these young men, that I may continue your friend, as I was your father's. I shall expect you to do this, and shall venture to remind you. But what say you of the matter of which I was speaking? The art of fighting in armour? Is that a practice in which the lads may be advantageously instructed? Socrates, I will endeavour to advise you, Lysimachus, as far as I can in this matter, and also in every way will comply with your wishes. But... As I am younger, and not so experienced, I think that I ought to hear what my elders have to say first, and to learn of them, and if I have anything to add, then I may venture to give my opinion to them as well as to you. Suppose, Nicias, that one of you speaks first. Nicias. I have no objection, Socrates, and my opinion is that the acquirement of this art is in many ways useful to young men. There is an advantage in their being employed during their leisure hours in a way which tends to improve their bodily constitution, and not in the way in which young men are too apt to be employed. No sort of gymnastics could be harder exercise, and this and the art of riding are of all arts most befitting to a free man, for they only who are thus trained in the use of implements of war are trained in the conflict which is set before us, or in that on which the conflict turns. Moreover, in actual battle, this sort of acquirement will be of some use when you have to fight in a line with a number of others, and will be of the greatest use when the ranks are broken and you have to fight singly, either in pursuit, when you are attacking someone who is defending himself, or in flight, when you have to defend yourself against an assailant. Certainly, he who possessed the art could not meet with any harm at the hands of a single person, or perhaps of several, and, in any case, he would have a great advantage. Further, this sort of skill inclines a man to other noble lessons, for every man who has learned how to fight in arms will desire to learn the proper arrangement of an army, which is the sequel of the lesson, and, when he has learned this, and his ambition is once fired, 
he will go on to learn the complete art of the general. There is no difficulty in seeing that the knowledge and practice of other military arts will be useful and valuable to a man, and this lesson may be the beginning of them. Let me add a further advantage, which is by no means a slight one, that this science will make any man a great deal more valiant and self-possessed in the field, and I will not disdain to mention what to some may appear to be a small matter, that he will make a better appearance at the right time, that is to say, at the time when his appearance will strike terror into his enemies. My opinion, then, Lysimachus, is, as I say, that the youths should be instructed in this art, and for the reasons which I have given. But I shall be very glad to hear Lachus, if he has another view. Lachus, I should not like to say, Nicias, that any kind of knowledge is not to be learned, for all knowledge appears to be a good, and if, as Nicias and as the teachers of it affirm, this art of fence is really a species of knowledge, then it ought to be learned. But if not, and if those who profess it are deceivers only, or if it be knowledge but not of a valuable sort, then what is the use of learning it? I say this because I think that if it had been really valuable, the Lacedaemonians, whose whole life is passed in finding out and practicing the arts, which give them an advantage over other nations in war, would have discovered this one. And, even if they had not, still these professors of the art would certainly not have failed to discover that of all the Hellenes the Lacedaemonians have the greatest interest in such matters, and that a master of the art who was honoured among them would have been sure to have made his fortune among other nations, just as a tragic poet would who is honoured among ourselves, which is the reason why he who fancies that he can write a tragedy does not go on a peregrination into the neighbouring states, but rushes hither straight and exhibits at Athens, and this is natural. Whereas I perceive that these fighters in armour regard Lacedaemon as a sacred, inviolable territory, which they do not touch with the point of their foot, but they make a circuit of the neighbouring states, and would rather exhibit to any others than to the Spartans, and particularly to those who would themselves acknowledge that they are by no means first-rate in the arts of war. Further, Lysimachus, I have encountered a good many of these gentlemen in actual service, and have taken their measure, which I can give you at once, for none of these masters of fence has ever been distinguished in war. There has been a sort of fatality about this, whereas in all other arts the men of note have been always those who have practised the art, but these appear to be a most unfortunate exception. For example, this very Stesilus, whom you and I have just witnessed exhibiting in all that crowd, and making such great professions of his powers, I have seen, at another time, making, in sober truth, an involuntary exhibition of himself, which was a far better spectacle. He was a marine on board a ship, which struck a transport vessel, and was armed with a weapon, half spear, half scythe, the singularity of which was worthy of the singularity of the man. To make a long story short, I will only tell you what happened to this notable invention of the scythe spear. He was fighting, and the scythe end caught in the rigging of the other ship, and stuck fast, and he tugged, but was unable to get his weapon free. The two ships were passing one another. He first ran along his own ship, holding on to the spear, but as the other ship passed by and drew him after, as he was holding on, he let the spear slip through his hand until he retained only the end of the handle. The people in the transport clapped their hands and laughed at his ridiculous figure, and when someone threw a stone which fell on the deck at his feet and he quitted his hold of the scythe spear, the crew of his own trireme also burst out laughing. They could not refrain when they beheld the weapon waving in the air, suspended from the transport. Now, I do not deny that there may be something in such an art, as Nicias asserts, but I tell you my experience, and, as I said at first, my opinion is, that whether this be an art which is of some slight advantage, or not an art at all, but only an imposition, in either case there is no use in such an inquirement. For my opinion is, that if the professor of this art be a coward, he will be likely to become rash, and his character will be only more notorious. Or, if he be brave, and fail ever so little, 
other men will be on the watch, and he will be greatly traduced, for there is a jealousy of such pretenders, and unless a man be pre-eminent in valour, he cannot help being ridiculous if he says that he has the skill in weapons. Such is my judgment, Lysimachus, of the desirableness of this art. But, as I said at first, ask Socrates, and do not let him go until he has given you his opinion of the matter. Lysimachus, I am going to ask this favour of you, Socrates, as is the more necessary because the two doctors disagree, and some one is needed to decide between them. Had they agreed, this might not have been required, but as Lachis has voted one way and Nicias another, I should like to hear with which of our two friends you agree. Socrates, what, Lysimachus, are you for going by the opinion of the majority? Lysimachus, why, yes, Socrates, what other way is there? Socrates, and would you agree in that, Melissius? If you were deliberating about the gymnastic training of your son, would you follow the advice of the majority of us, or the opinion of the one who had been trained and exercised under a skilful master? Melissius, I should take the advice of the latter, Socrates, as would be reasonable. Socrates, his one vote would be worth more than the vote of all us four? Melissius, certainly. Socrates, and for this reason, as I imagine, because a good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers? Melissius, to be sure. Socrates, must we not then first of all ask whether there is any one of us who has knowledge in that about which we are deliberating? If there is, let us take his advice, though he be one only, and not mind the others. If there is not, let us seek further counsel. Is this a slight matter about which you and Lysimachus are deliberating? Are you not risking the greatest of your possessions? For children are your riches, and upon their turning out well or ill will depend the whole order of their father's house. Melissius, that is true. Socrates, great care then is required in the matter? Melissius, certainly. Socrates, suppose, as I was just now saying, that we were considering, or wanting to consider, who was the best trainer. Should we not decide in his favour who knew, and had practised the art, and had the best teachers? Melissius, I think that we should. Socrates, but would there not arise a prior question about the nature of the art of which we want to find the masters? Melissius, I do not understand. Socrates, let me try to make my meaning plainer, then. I do not think that we have, as yet, decided what that is about which we are consulting, when we ask which of us is skilled in that, and which of us has or has not had a teacher of the art. Nicias, why, Socrates, is not the question whether young men ought or ought not to learn the art of fighting in armour? Socrates, yes, Nicias, but there is also a prior question which I may illustrate in this way. When a person considers about applying a medicine to the eyes, would you say that he is consulting about the medicine or about the eyes? Nicias, about the eyes. Socrates, and when he considers if he shall set a bridle on a horse, he thinks of the horse and not of the bridle? Nicias, true. Socrates, and in a word, when he considers anything for the sake of another thing, he thinks of the end and not of the means? Nicias, certainly. Socrates, and when you call in an adviser, you should see whether he is skilful in the accomplishment of the end which you have in view, as well as of the means? Nicias, most true. Socrates, and at present we have in view some kind of knowledge, the end of which is the soul of youth? Nicias, yes. Socrates, the question is, which of us is skillful or successful in the treatment of the soul, and which of us has had good teachers? Lachis, well, but Socrates, did you never observe that some persons who have had no teachers are more skillful than those who have in some things? Socrates, yes, Lachis, I have observed that, but you would not be very willing to trust them if they only professed to be masters of their art, unless they could show some proof of their skill or excellence in one or more works? Lachis, that is true. Socrates, 
and therefore lacus and nicias as lysimachus and melissius in their anxiety to improve the minds of their sons have asked our advice about them we too should inform them who our teachers were if we say that we have any and prove them to be men of merit and experienced trainers of the minds of youth and really our teachers or if any of us says that he has no teacher but that he has works to show of his own then he should point out to them what athenians or strangers bond or free he is generally acknowledged to have improved but if he can show neither teachers nor works then they should ask him to look out for others and not to run the risk of spoiling the children of friends which is the most formidable accusation that can be brought against any one by his near and dear relations as for myself lysimachus and melissius i am the first to confess that i have never had a teacher although i have always from my earliest youth desired to have one but i am too poor to give money to the sophists who are the only professors of moral improvement and to this day i have never been able to discover the art myself though i should not be surprised if nicias or lacus may have learned or discovered it for they are far wealthier than i am and may therefore have learned of others and they are older too so that they have had more time to make the discovery and i really believe that they are able to educate a man for unless they had been confident in their own knowledge they would never have spoken thus decidedly of the pursuits which are advantageous or hurtful to a young man i repose confidence in both of them but i do not understand why they differ from one another and therefore lysimachus as lacus suggests that you should detain me and not let me go until i have answered i in turn earnestly beseech and advise you to detain lacus and nicias and question them i would have you say to them socrates says that he has no knowledge of the matter and that he is unable to decide which of you speaks truly neither discoverer nor student is he of anything of the kind but you lacus and nicias should either of you tell us who is the most skilful educator whom you have ever known and whether you invented the art yourselves or learned of another and if you learned who were your respective teachers and who were their brothers in the art and then if you are too much occupied in politics to teach us yourselves let us go to them and present them with gifts or make interest with them or both in the hope that they may be induced to take charge of all our families in order that they may not grow up inferior and disgrace their ancestors but if you are yourselves original discoverers in that field give us some proof of your skill who are they who having been inferior persons have become under your care good and noble for if this is your first attempt at education there is a danger that you may be trying the experiment not on the vile corpus of a carrion slave but on your own sons or the sons of your friend and as the proverb says break the large vessel in learning to make pots tell us then what qualities you claim or do not claim make them tell you this lysimachus and do not let them off lysimachus i very much approve of the words of socrates my friends but you nicias and lacus must determine whether you will be questioned and give an explanation about matters of this sort assuredly i and melissius would be greatly pleased to hear you answer the questions which socrates asks if you will for i began by saying that we took you into our counsels because we thought you would be likely to have attended to the subject especially as you have children who like our own are nearly of an age to be educated suppose then if you have no objection that you take socrates into partnership and do you and he ask and answer one another's questions for as he has well said we are deliberating about the most important of our concerns i hope that you will see fit to comply with our request nicias i see very clearly lysimachus that you have only known socrates's father and have no acquaintance with socrates himself at least you can only have known him when he was a child and may have met him among his fellow tribesmen in company with his father at a sacrifice or at some other gathering you clearly show that you have never known him since he arrived at manhood lysimachus why do you say that nicias nicias 
you don't seem to be aware that any one to whom Socrates has an intellectual affinity is liable to be drawn into an argument with him, and whatever subject may be started by him, he will be continually carried round and round by him, until at last he finds that he has to give an account both of his present and past life, and when he is once entangled, Socrates will not let him go until he has completely and thoroughly sifted him. Now, I am used to his ways, and I know that he will certainly do this, and also I know that I myself will be the sufferer, for I am fond of his company, Lysimachus. Neither do I think that there is any harm in being reminded of the evil which we are, or have been doing. He who does not fly from reproof will be sure to take more heed of his afterlife. He will wish and desire to learn as long as he lives, as Solon says, and will not think that old age of itself brings wisdom. To me, to be cross-examined by Socrates is neither unusual nor unpleasant. Indeed, I knew all along that where Socrates was, the argument would soon pass from our sons to ourselves. And therefore, as I say, as far as I am concerned, I am quite willing to discourse with Socrates in his own manner. But you had better ask our friend Lachis what his feeling may be. Lachis. I have but one feeling, Nicias, or, shall I say, two feelings about discussions, and to some I may seem to be a lover, and to others a hater of discourse, for when I hear a man discoursing of virtue, or of any sort of wisdom, who is a true man, and worthy of his theme, I am delighted beyond measure, and I compare the man and his words, and note the harmony in correspondence of them, and such an one I deem to be the true musician, having in himself a fairer harmony than that of the lyre, or any pleasant instrument of music, for truly he has in his own life a harmony of words and deeds arranged not in the Ionian or in the Phrygian mode, nor yet in the Lydian, but in the true Hellenic mode, which is the Dorian and no other. Such a one makes me merry with the sound of his voice, and when I hear him I am thought to be a lover of discourse, so eager am I in drinking in his words but when I hear a man of opposite character I am annoyed, and the better he speaks the more I hate him, and then I seem to be a hater of discourse. As to Socrates, I have no knowledge of his words, but of old, as would seem, I have had experience of his deeds, and his deeds show that free and noble sentiments may be expected from him, and if his words accord, then I am of one mind with him, and shall be delighted to be interrogated by a man such as he is, and shall not be annoyed at having to learn of him. For I agree with Solon, that I would fain grow old, learning many things. But I must be allowed to add, of the good only, Socrates must be willing to allow that he is a good teacher, or I shall be a dull and uncongenial pupil. But that the teacher is younger, or not as yet in repute, anything of that sort is of no account with me, and therefore, Socrates, I give you notice that you may teach and confute me as much as ever you like, and also learn of me anything which I know. Such is the opinion which I have had of you ever since that day on which you were my companion in danger, and gave an unmistakable proof of your valour. Therefore, say whatever you like, and do not mind about the difference of our ages. Socrates, I cannot say that either of you show any reluctance to take counsel and advise with me, Lysimachus, but that is our business in which I regard you as having a common interest, for I reckon you as one of us. Please then to take my place and find out from Nicias and Lachis what we want to know, for the sake of the youths, and talk and advise with them, for I am old and my memory is bad and I do not remember the questions which I am going to ask, or the answers to them, and if there is any interruption I am quite lost. I will therefore beg of you to carry on the proposed discussion by yourselves, and I will listen, and Melissius and I will act upon your conclusions. Socrates, let us, Nicias and Lachis, comply with the request of Lysimachus and Melissius. There would be no harm in asking ourselves the question which was first proposed to us, who have been our own instructors in this sort of training, and whom we have made better.
but the other mode of carrying on the inquiry will bring us to the same point and will be more like proceeding from first principles for if we knew that the addition of something would improve some other thing and were able to make the addition then clearly we must know how that about which we are advising may be best and most easily attained perhaps you do not understand what i mean then let me make my meaning plainer in this way suppose we know that the addition of sight makes better the eyes which possess this gift and also were able to impart sight to the eyes then clearly we should know the nature of sight when asked how this gift of sight may be best and most easily attained for if we knew neither what sight is nor what hearing is we should not be very good medical advisers about the eyes or the ears or about the best mode of giving sight and hearing to them Lacus, that is true socrates socrates and are not our two friends Lacus, at this very moment inviting us to consider in what way the gift of virtue may be imparted to their sons for the improvement of their minds Lacus, very true socrates then must we not first know the nature of virtue for how if we are wholly ignorant of this can we advise any one about the best mode of attaining it Lacus, i do not think that we can socrates socrates then Lacus, we may presume that we know the nature of virtue Lacus, yes socrates and that which we know we must surely be able to tell Lacus, certainly socrates i would not have us begin my friend with inquiring about the whole of virtue for that may be too much for us let us first consider whether we have a sufficient knowledge of a part that will probably be an easier mode of proceeding Lacus, let us do as you say socrates socrates then which of the parts of virtue shall we select must we not select that to which the use of arms is supposed to conduce and is not that generally supposed to be courage Lacus, yes certainly socrates then Lacus, suppose that we first set about determining the nature of courage and in the second place proceed to inquire how the young men may attain this quality of courage as far as this is to be effected by the help of studies and pursuits try and see whether you can tell me what is courage Lacus, indeed socrates that is soon answered he is a man of courage who remains at his post and does not run away but fights against the enemy of that you may be very certain socrates that is good Lacus, and yet i fear that i did not express myself clearly and therefore you have answered not the question which i intended to ask but another Lacus, what do you mean socrates socrates i will endeavour to explain you would call a man courageous who remains at his post and fights with the enemy Lacus, certainly i should socrates and so should i but what would you say of another man who fights flying instead of remaining Lacus, how flying socrates why as the scythians are said to fight flying as well as pursuing and as homer says in praise of the horses of aeneas that they knew how to pursue and fly quickly hither and thither and he passes an encomium on aeneas himself as having a knowledge of fear or flight and calls him an author of fear or flight Lacus, yes socrates and there homer is right for he was speaking of chariots as you were speaking of the scythian cavalry who have that way of fighting but the heavy armed greek fights as i say remaining in his rank socrates and yet Lacus, you must accept the lacedaemonians at plataea who when they came upon the light shields of the persians are said not to have been willing to stand and fight and to have fled but when the ranks of the persians were broken they turned upon them like cavalry and won the battle Lacus, that is true socrates that was my meaning when i said that i was to blame in having put my question badly and that this was the reason of your answering badly for i meant to ask you not only about the courage of heavy-armed soldiers but about the courage of cavalry and every other style of soldier and not only who are courageous in war but who are courageous in perils by sea and who in disease or poverty or again in politics are courageous and not only who are courageous against pain or fear 
but mighty to contend against desires and pleasures, either fixed in their rank or turning upon their enemy. There is this sort of courage, is there not? Lacus, certainly, Socrates, Socrates, and all these are courageous, but some have courage in pleasures and some in pains, some in desires and some in fears, and some are cowards under the same conditions as I should imagine. Lacus, very true. Socrates, now I was asking about courage and cowardice in general, and I will begin with courage and once more ask, what is that common quality which is the same in all these cases, and which is called courage? Do you understand now what I mean? Lacus, not over well. Socrates, I mean this, as I might ask, what is that quality which is called quickness, and which is found in running, playing the lyre, speaking, learning, and in many other similar actions, or rather, which we possess in nearly every action that can be mentioned of arms or legs, mouth, voice, mind. Would you not apply the term quickness to all of them? Lacus, quite true. Socrates, and suppose I were to be asked by some one, what is that common quality, Socrates, which in all these uses of the word you call quickness? I should say, that which accomplishes much in a little time. That I call quickness in running, speaking, and every other sort of action. Lacus, you would be quite correct. Socrates, and now, Lacus, do you try and tell me, what is that common quality which is called courage, and which includes all the various uses of the term when applied both to pleasure and pain, and in all the cases which I was just now mentioning? Lacus, I should say that courage is a sort of endurance of the soul, if I am to speak of the universal nature which pervades them all. Socrates, but that is what we must do if we are to answer the question, and yet I cannot say that every kind of endurance is, in my opinion, to be deemed courage. Hear my reason. I am sure, Lacus, that you would consider courage to be a very noble quality. Lacus, most noble, certainly, Socrates. And you would say that a wise endurance is also good and noble? Lacus, very noble, Socrates. But what would you say of a foolish endurance? Is not that, on the other hand, to be regarded as evil and hurtful? Lacus, true, Socrates. And is anything noble which is evil and hurtful? Lacus, I ought not to say that, Socrates. Socrates, then you would not admit that sort of endurance to be courage, for that is not noble, but courage is noble? Lacus, you are right. Socrates, then, according to you, only the wise endurance is courage? Lacus, true. Socrates, but as to the epithet, wise, wise in what? In all things small as well as great? For example, if a man endures in spending his money wisely, knowing that by spending he will acquire more in the end, do you call him courageous? Lacus, assuredly not. Socrates, or, for example, if a man is a physician, and his son, or some patient of his, has inflammation of the lungs, and begs that he may be allowed to eat or drink something, and the other refuses, is that courage? Lacus, no, that is not courage at all, any more than the last. Socrates, again, take the case of one who endures in war, and is willing to fight, and wisely calculates and knows that others will help him and that there will be fewer and inferior men against him than there are with him, and suppose that he has also advantages of position. Would you say of such a one, who endures with all this wisdom and preparation, that he, or some man in the opposing army, who is in the opposite circumstances to these, and yet endures and remains at his post, is the braver? Lacus, I should say the latter Socrates was the braver. Socrates, but surely this is a foolish endurance in comparison with the other. Lacus, that is true. Socrates, and you would say that he who in an engagement of cavalry endures, having the knowledge of horsemanship, is not so courageous as he who endures, having no knowledge of horsemanship? Lacus, that is my view. Socrates, and he who endures, having a knowledge of the use of the sling, or the bow, or any other art, is not so courageous as he who endures, not having such a knowledge? Lacus, true. Socrates, and he who descends into a well, 
and dives and holds out in this or any similar action having no knowledge of diving or the like is as you would say more courageous than those who have this knowledge Lacus, why socrates what else can a man say socrates nothing if that is what he thinks Lacus, but that is what i do think socrates and yet men who thus run risks and endure are but foolish Lacus, in comparison of those who do the same things having the skill to do them Lacus, that is true socrates but foolish boldness and endurance appeared before to be base and hurtful to us Lacus, quite true socrates whereas courage was acknowledged to be a noble quality Lacus, true socrates and now on the contrary we are saying that the foolish endurance which was before held in dishonour is courage Lacus, very true socrates and are we right in saying that Lacus, indeed socrates i am sure that we are not right socrates then according to your statement you and i Lacus, are not attuned to the dorian mode which is a harmony of words and deeds for our deeds are not in accordance with our words any one would say that we had courage who saw us in action but not i imagine he who heard us talking about courage just now Lacus, that is most true socrates and is this condition of ours satisfactory Lacus, quite the reverse socrates suppose however that we admit our principle to a certain extent Lacus, what principle and what are we to admit socrates the principle of endurance let us to endure and persevere in the inquiry and then courage will not laugh at our faint-heartedness in searching for courage which after all may very likely be endurance Lacus, i am ready to go on socrates and yet i am unused to investigations of this sort but the spirit of controversy has been aroused in me by what has been said and i am really grieved at being thus unable to express my meaning for i fancy that i do not know the nature of courage but somehow or other she has slipped away from me and i cannot get hold of her and tell her nature socrates but my dear friend should not the good sportsman follow the track and not be lazy Lacus, certainly he should socrates and shall we invite nicias to join us he may be better at the sport than we are what do you say Lacus, i should like that socrates come then nicias and do what you can to help your friends who are tossing on the waves of argument and at the last gasp you see our extremity and may save us and also settle your own opinion if you will tell us what you think about courage nicias i have been thinking socrates that you and Lacus are not defining courage in the right way for you have forgotten an excellent saying which i have heard from your own lips socrates what is that nicias nicias i have often heard you say that every man is good in that in which he is wise and bad in that in which he is unwise socrates that is certainly true nicias nicias and therefore if the brave man is good he is also wise socrates do you hear him Lacus? Lacus, yes i hear him but i don't quite understand him socrates i think that i understand him and he appears to me to mean that courage is a sort of wisdom Lacus, what sort of wisdom socrates socrates that is a question which you must ask of nicias Lacus, yes socrates tell him then nicias what you mean by this wisdom for you surely do not mean the wisdom which plays on the flute nicias certainly not socrates nor the wisdom which plays the lyre nicias no socrates but what is this knowledge then and of what Lacus, i think that you put the question to him very well socrates and i would like him to say what is the nature of this knowledge or wisdom nicias i mean to say Lacus, that courage is the knowledge of that which inspires fear or confidence in war or in anything Lacus, how strangely he is talking socrates socrates what makes you say that Lacus? Lacus what makes me say that why surely courage is one thing and wisdom another socrates that is just what nicias denies Lacus, yes that is what he denies in his foolishness socrates 
shall we enlighten him instead of abusing him nicias lachis does not want to enlighten me socrates but having been proved to be talking nonsense himself he wants to prove that i have been doing the same lachis very true nicias and you are talking nonsense as i shall endeavour to show let me ask you a question do not physicians know the dangers of disease or do the courageous know them or are the physicians the same as the courageous nicias not at all lachis no more than the husbandmen who know the dangers of husbandry or other masters of crafts who have a knowledge of that which inspires them with fear or confidence in their own crafts and yet they are not courageous a whit the more for that socrates what is lachis saying nicias he appears to be saying something nicias yes he is saying something but something which is not true socrates how is that nicias why because he does not see that the physician's knowledge only extends to the nature of health and disease he can tell the sick man that and nothing more do you imagine lachis that the physician knows whether health or disease is the more terrible to a man had not many a man better never get up from a sick bed i should like to know whether you think that life is always better than death may not death often be the better of the two lachis yes i certainly think that nicias and do you think that the same things are terrible to those to whom to die is better and to those to whom to live is better lachis certainly not nicias and do you suppose that the physician or any other artist knows this or any one indeed except he who is skilled in the grounds of fear and hope and him i call the courageous socrates do you understand his meaning lachis lachis yes i suppose that in his way of speaking the soothsayers are courageous for who but one of them can know to whom to die or to live is better and yet nicias would you allow that you are yourself a soothsayer or are you neither soothsayer nor courageous nicias what do you mean to say that the soothsayer ought to know the grounds of hope or fear lachis indeed i do who but he nicias much rather i should say he of whom i speak for the soothsayer ought to know only the signs of things that are about to come to pass whether death or disease or loss of property or victory or defeat in war or in any sort of contest but to whom the suffering or not suffering of these things will be for the best can no more be decided by the soothsayer than by one who is no soothsayer lachis i cannot understand what nicias would be at socrates for he represents the courageous man as neither a soothsayer nor a physician nor in any other character unless he means to say that he is a god my opinion is that he does not like honestly to confess that he is talking nonsense but that he shuffles up and down in order to conceal the difficulty into which he has got himself you and i socrates might have practised a similar shuffle just now if we had only wanted to avoid the appearance of contradiction and if we had been arguing in a court of law there might have been reason in this but why should a man deck himself out with vain words at a meeting of friends such as this socrates i quite agree with you lachis that he should not but perhaps nicias is serious and not merely talking for the sake of talking let us ask him to explain what he means and if he has reason on his side we will agree with him if not we will instruct him lachis do you socrates if you like ask him i think that i have asked enough socrates i don't see why i should not and my question will do for both of us lachis very good socrates then tell me nicias or rather tell us for lachis and i are partners in the argument do you mean to affirm that courage is the knowledge of the grounds of hope and fear nicias i do socrates and that is a very special knowledge which is not possessed by the physician or prophet who will not be courageous unless they superadd this particular knowledge that is what you were saying nicias i was socrates then courage is not a thing which every pig would have any more than he would have knowledge as the proverb says nicias i think not socrates clearly not nicias 
not even such a big pig as the Cromuonian sow would be called by you courageous. And this I say, not as a joke, but because I think that he who assents to your doctrine that courage is the knowledge of the grounds of fear and hope cannot allow that any wild beast is courageous, unless he admits that a lion, or a leopard, or perhaps a boar, or any other animal, has a degree of wisdom which but a few human beings, and these only with difficulty, attain. He who takes your view of courage must affirm that a lion and a stag and a bull and a monkey have equally little pretensions to courage. Lacus, capital Socrates, by the gods, that is truly good, and I hope, Nicias, that you will tell us whether these animals, which we all admit to be courageous, are really wiser than mankind, or whether you will have the boldness, in the face of universal opinion, to deny their courage. Nicias, why, Lacus, I don't call animals, or any other things courageous, which have no fear of dangers, because they are ignorant of them, but fearless and senseless only. Do you think that I should call little children courageous, which fear no dangers because they know none? There is a difference, as I should imagine, between fearlessness and courage. Now I am of opinion that thoughtful courage is a quality possessed by very few, but that rashness and boldness and fearlessness, which has no forethought, are very common qualities possessed by many men, many women, many children, many animals. And you, and men in general, call by the term courageous actions, which I call rash, and my courageous actions are wise actions. Lacus, behold Socrates, how admirably, as he thinks, he dresses himself out in words, while seeking to deprive of the honour of courage those whom all the world acknowledges to be courageous. Nicias, be of good cheer, Lacus, for I am quite willing to say of you, and also of Lamachus, and of many other Athenians, that you are courageous and therefore wise. Lacus, I could answer that, but I would not have you cast in my teeth that I am a haughty Ixonian. Socrates, I would not have you answer him, for I fancy, Lacus, that you have not discovered whence his wisdom comes. He has got all this from my friend Damon, and Damon is always with Prodicus, who, of all the sophists, is considered to be the best taker to pieces of words of this sort. Lacus, yes, Socrates, and the examination of such niceties is a much more suitable employment for a sophist than for a great statesman whom the city chooses to preside over her. Socrates, but still, my sweet friend, a great statesman is just the man to have a great mind, and I think that the view which is implied in Nicias's definition of courage is worthy of examination. Lacus, then examine for yourself, Socrates. Socrates, that is what I am going to do, my dear friend. Don't, however, suppose that I shall let you out of the partnership, for I shall expect you to apply your mind and join with me in the consideration of the question. Lacus, I do not object if you think that I ought. Socrates, yes, I do, and I must beg of you, Nicias, to begin again. You remember that we originally considered courage to be a part of virtue? Nicias, very true. Socrates, and you yourself said that this was a part, and that there were many other parts, all of which together are called virtue? Nicias, certainly. Socrates, do you agree with me about the parts? For I say that justice, temperance, and the like, are all of them parts of virtue as well as courage. Would you not say the same? Nicias, certainly. Socrates, well then, about that we are agreed. And now let us proceed a step, and see whether we are equally agreed about the fearful and the hopeful. Let me tell you my own opinion, and if I am wrong you shall set me right. My opinion is that the terrible and the hopeful are the things which do or do not create fear, and that fear is not of the present, nor of the past, but is of future and expected evil. Do you not agree to that, Lacus? Lacus. Yes, Socrates, entirely. Socrates. That is my view, Nicias. The terrible things, as I should say, are the evils which are future, and the hopeful are the good or not evil things which are future. Do you, or do you not agree in this? Nicias. I agree. Socrates. And the knowledge of these things you call courage? Nicias. 
Precisely. Socrates. And now let me see whether you agree with Lacus and myself in a third point. Nicias. What is that? Socrates. I will tell you. He and I have a notion that there is not one knowledge or science of the past, another of the present, a third, of what will be and will be best in the future, but that of all three there is one science only. For example, there is one science of medicine which is concerned with the inspection of health equally in all times, present, past, and future, and of husbandry in like manner which is concerned with the productions of the earth, and, as to the general's art, you yourself will be my witnesses that the general has to think of the future as well as the present, and he considers that he is not to be the servant of the soothsayer, but his master, because he knows better what is happening, or is likely to happen in war, and accordingly the law places the soothsayer under the general, and not the general under the soothsayer. Am I not correct, Lacus? Lacus. Quite correct. Socrates. And do you, Nicias, also acknowledge that the same science has understanding of the same things, whether future, present, or past? Nicias. Yes, indeed, Socrates. That is my opinion. Socrates. And courage, my friend, is, as you say, a knowledge of the fearful and of the hopeful? Nicias. Yes. Socrates. And the fearful and the hopeful are admitted to be future goods and future evils? Nicias. True. Socrates, and the same science has to do with the same things in the future or at any time? Nicias, that is true. Socrates, then courage is not the science which is concerned with the fearful and hopeful, for they are future only, and courage, like the other sciences, is concerned not only with good and evil of the future, but of the present and past, and of any time? Nicias, that, as I suppose, is true. Socrates, then the answer which you have given, Nicias, includes only a third part of courage, but our question extended to the whole nature of courage, and, according to your view, that is, according to your present view, courage is not only the knowledge of the hopeful and the fearful, but seems to include nearly every good and evil without reference to time. What do you say to that alteration in your statement? Nicias, I agree to that, Socrates. Socrates, but then, my dear friend, if a man knew all good and evil, and how they are, and have been, and will be produced, would he not be perfect and wanting in no virtue, whether justice, or temperance, or holiness? He would possess them all, and he would know which were dangers, and which were not, and guard against them, whether they were supernatural or natural, and he would provide the good, as he would know how to deal with gods or men. Nicias. I think, Socrates, that there is a great deal of truth in what you say. Socrates, but then, Nicias, courage, according to this new definition of yours, instead of being a part of virtue only, will be all virtue? Nicias, I suppose that is true. Socrates, but we were saying that courage is one of the parts of virtue? Nicias, yes, that was what we were saying. Socrates, and that is in contradiction with our present view? Nicias, that appears to be the case. Socrates. Then, Nicias, we have not discovered what courage is. Nicias. We have not. Lacus. And yet, friend Nicias, I imagined that you would have made the discovery, as you were so contemptuous of the answers which I made to Socrates. I had very great hopes that you would have been enlightened by the wisdom of Damon. Nicias. I perceive, Lacus, that you think nothing of having displayed your ignorance of the nature of courage, but you look only to see whether I have not made a similar display, and if we are both equally ignorant of the things which a man who is good for anything should know, that, I suppose, will be of no consequence. You certainly appear to me very like the rest of the world, looking at your neighbor and not at yourself. I am of opinion that enough has been said on the subject of discussion, and if anything has been imperfectly said, that may be hereafter corrected by the help of Damon, whom you think to deride, although you have never seen him, and with the help of others. And when I am satisfied myself, I will freely impart my satisfaction to you, for I think that you are very much in want of knowledge. Lacus, you are a philosopher, Nicias, of that I am aware. Nevertheless, I would recommend Lysimachus and Melissius 
not to take you and me as advisers about the education of their children, but, as I said at first, they should ask Socrates, and, if my sons were old enough, I would have asked him myself. Nicias, to that I quite agree, if Socrates is willing to take them under his charge. I should not wish for any one else to be the tutor of Nicerotos, but I observe that when I mention the matter to him, he recommends to me some other tutor, and refuses himself. Perhaps he may be more ready to listen to you, Lysimachus. Lysimachus. He ought, Nicias, for certainly I would do things for him, which I would not do for many others. What do you say, Socrates? Will you comply? And are you ready to give assistance in the improvement of the youths? Socrates. Indeed, Lysimachus, I should be very wrong in refusing to aid in the improvement of anybody, and if I had shown in this conversation that I had a knowledge which Nicias and Lachis have not, then I admit that you would be right in inviting me to perform this duty. But, as we are all in the same perplexity, why should one of us be preferred to another? I certainly think that no one should, and, under these circumstances, let me offer you a piece of advice, and this need not go further than ourselves. I maintain, my friends, that every one of us should seek out the best teacher whom he can find, first for ourselves and then for the youth, regardless of expense or anything. But I cannot advise that we remain as we are, and if anyone laughs at us for going to school at our age, I would quote to them the authority of Homer who says that modesty is not good for a needy man. Let us then, regardless of the remarks which are made upon us, make the education of the youth our own education. Lysimachus. I like your proposal, Socrates, and, as I am the oldest, I am also the most eager to go to school with the boys. Let me beg a favor of you. Come to my house tomorrow at dawn, and we will advise about these matters. For the present, let us make an end of the conversation. Socrates. I will come to you tomorrow, Lysimachus, as you propose, God willing. End of Lacus by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Read by Geoffrey Edwards. Meta coordinated by Anne Boulet. Proof listened by Rapunzelina. Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards.